Welcome to the BCIT Passive House video series. I'm Joe Galush of Daikun Contracting Limited, and I'll be your host as we walk you through the design and construction of a certified passive home right here on this site in beautiful West Vancouver, BC. So this particular passive house is approximately 4,100 square feet, four bedrooms, and sits on a 50 by 140 lot. In order to meet the stringent requirements of the passive house certification, this particular home posed some very interesting design challenges. I guess our first response in, in looking at the plans and drawings was that this doesn't really look like a passive house. This looks like a, a very contemporary, really cool looking Battersby How It Designed house that also happened to be a passive house. So our, our challenges were to suit the architectural requirements and also suit the passive house requirements. The architecture wasn't really compromised, so to speak, for it to become a, a passive house. We, we applied passive house principles to a very contemporary and modern design. The, the project's located in West Vancouver, and um, a lot of the properties are uh, south-oriented and have a view towards the water, and so it's kind of the perfect setting for a passive house and would be an, an ideal passive house community. And say if you would have a project in the city, if like a tree or a neighboring house or the orientation um, are not advantageous, it's harder to achieve passive house than say at our project because of the orientation. I think the, the values for insulation that we need to meet are much more relaxed because of the, the optimal um, location to, to face south. I would say that from sort of an architectural point of view, the expression and detailing, we were able to, to push for what we, what we wanted and, um, and then everybody was very supportive in making that work. In this case, we, we have a major view corridor to the south and so that, that south facade is almost exclusively glazed. That glass limits the ability to put in either shear walls or seismic braces. And so the challenge from our end becomes to incorporate that glass, limit thermal bridging, and also have this building stand up uh, in heavy winds or in, a, in an earthquake. This episode, we're gonna be looking at the Passive House principles as it applies to the foundation. This will include air tightness, super insulation, and reducing thermal bridges. So if you're ready to start, let's begin. Well, basically what we're doing right now, today we started putting on uh, the two x 12, which is gonna support our uh, the 2x12 which is going to support the edge of our foundation. Um, basically it's a slab on grade with a 12 inch thickening for the footing, for the perimeter for the uh, concrete walls. Yesterday we actually put down a bunch of the poly and did a bunch of the taping. So basically that's really important. So we took a whole day pretty much just putting the poly down and started the taping. We were able to identify areas of high concentrated loads where we needed to use more expensive, higher strength, higher density foam insulation uh, and other areas with sort of nominal loads like underneath slabs on grade. Uh, we could just use sort of low-grade EPS insulation. We also wanted to make sure that we had a solid base to work from. For that reason, we decided to build concrete for the foundations and the first level. So we had some more flexibility in what we could do up until that first level. It also helped us with the lateral design. There's some retaining walls below grade up until, up until level two. Because we had insulation underneath the concrete foundation, we had to transfer all the gravity loads out through that insulation, and it required a bit more of a detailed analysis, taking into account the stiffness of the foundation and, and understanding where those loads go. We extended a, the concrete level on, on level one, out about 12 feet, cantilevering out towards the ocean. Another um, important aspect in passive house buildings is the um, high thermal insulation and um, thermal bridge-free design. So what that means is that you use uh, more insulation than you would usually be required by building code. So now that our air tightness is done, we're actually going to add the insulation now so we don't have to worry about it being airtight. Now we can just add this typical exterior insulation on a foundation. Basically once that's on, we're going to push this into place. That PL will just help pull this. We won't be drilling through into our foundation, creating no thermal bridging, no nothing like that, and no punctures, especially into our, our vapor barrier, right, which is very crucial in the passive home. Hi, hey, my name is Stuart Hood. I'm the managing principal of Integral Group in Vancouver. I'm also a certified passive house designer, and I'm a mechanical engineer looking after the HVAC design for, uh, for this passive house. 
At the heart of, uh, of every passive house is an energy recovery ventilator or a heat recovery ventilator. In this case, we have an energy recovery ventilator. This is the unit here. It's a Zendo Q600. Passive house is so well insulated and there's such a high performance envelope. We need a very small amount of, of, of heating and that's why we're able to, to transfer that heat energy to the house uh, directly through the ventilation system. So the heating and cooling system uh, for the house is, uh, at the heart of that is a Daikin Alferma system. So this is an air source heat pump. So it's, it's taking heat from the, from the air in the winter. It works down to like minus 20 degrees centigrade. It will still pull heat out of the air. And we take that heat and then we put it into the, um, into the air system. So on the exhaust side, we have the uh, white tubes that you see up top here. So uh, they're uninsulated tubes and they're taking air from the bathrooms and the kitchen and uh, other storage rooms. And then we also have the, um, uh, the silver looking pipes here, which are the same as the white pipes, but they're insulated. And that's taking supply out to all the bedrooms and, and living spaces. This is a unique system due to a couple of factors. Uh, the first one being that we are utilizing an air-to-water heat pump uh, made by Daikin and it ties to a couple of comfo post coils that are downstream of the airflow uh, to additionally heat or cool the air to each room. So in terms of um, filtration for, for forest fires, the, uh, the Zander unit here has two uh, what we classify as MERV-13 filters. We're going to be using the uh, Haven sensor from Tozoa. And we're gonna be placing that within the ductwork of the system. So we're gonna measure the incoming air, both before the filters and after the filters, and also the exhaust air coming out of the house. So we're gonna know what's happening in the house and how, what's the quality of the air that we're putting in and out. The integration process to home automation seems very seamless. There's only a couple of items to install. One of those being the um, controller box and the other being the LAN box. And those directly integrate into the Q600 very easily.